Hi everyone, I hope you're keeping safe and well. My name's Richard Peters, I'm a wildlife photographer and Nikon ambassador from the UK and I'd like to welcome you to another Create Your Light Challenge. As we're all spending a lot more time at home at the moment, this theme is all about wildlife photography at home and celebrating the wildlife found on our doorsteps, in our gardens and maybe even around our homes. Now I'd be willing to bet there's plenty of wildlife in your garden even if you don't realise it. Looking around here at the moment, my garden seems pretty empty but there's tons of birds coming in and out there are even a few mammals, you might get lucky and have the same. And of course, if you're a macro photographer, there'll be tons of insects. The important thing to remember with this theme is we have no control over the subjects that come into our garden. We're at home, we're not out in the wilderness, we can't go out to find something specific. We have to photograph whatever's available to us. So let's not worry about what subjects we're photographing and let's concentrate more on how we're going to photograph them. With that in mind, we're going to be looking at different types of lighting, ambient light and different ways of using that, using some flash, different lenses and a few other tips and tricks along the way that I think you might find quite useful. So it's really important to encourage wildlife into your garden by putting up bird feeders if you haven't done so already and especially in the summer months and as it gets warmer to make sure there's a fresh water source. And if you do these two things you'll definitely have wildlife coming into the garden on a much more regular basis. All there is left to do now is get on with the first tip. So for this tip, we're gonna be looking at props and things we can use to add some interest to our photos. The idea here is to use whatever's available. It's one of those rare times where a wildlife photo can actually get away with having a man-made object in it. Move your props around the garden if you need to, put them closer to feeders to encourage birds to land on them, or if it's something that's too big or heavy to move, then try moving your feeder closer to your prop. The idea is to challenge yourself to come up with as many different looking photos as you can by using the same prop and just changing your lenses and using different types of lighting. So let's look at a couple of ideas to get you started. So what I did was I started off by having photos of the pigeons walking across the top of the bench in different types of lighting. So I tried some backlighting, I tried some overcast light and I tried some dappled light to see the differences in having the lens in the same position pointing in the same direction at the same object and how the different lighting would impact those photos. And as you can see, just the lighting alone has made the differences between those photos quite striking. I tried using different lenses, so I used a 70 to 200 to do the pigeons walking across the top. I tried to shoot across the top of the bench using a 105 1.4 lens so I could get a really nice soft diffusion to have kind of like an out of focus perch. And I also used a wide angle lens to shoot through the armrest of the bench along the seat so that your eye is drawn towards the pigeon by all the slats of the bench going towards this one focal point. My favourite photo was actually using a wide angle lens and shooting up across the bench and into the sky above and it kind of gave the bird a sense of grandeur. It was just a more interesting and kind of fun way of photographing a pigeon and using the bench. And then one last thing I tried was to use a flash placed above the bench, firing down through the slats at night. The badger walked under the bench and then the flash being above firing down between the slats caused these nice shafts of light that kind of mimic the fur of the badger. So hopefully that's given you some inspiration and some kind of idea of what you can do with garden props. So now all you need to do is head out into your garden, find yourself a prop and see how many different ways you can incorporate it into your photos. So for this tip, we're gonna think outside the box a little bit. And instead of photographing the wildlife in our gardens, we're gonna look up. And that's not to photograph animals in trees, but actually, on rooftops. Now this may sound like a slightly strange thing to do, but if I squeeze down here and I look across to one of the neighbouring roof lines, it's got some really nice ornamental ridge tiles, there's some nice texture, there's some nice colour, there's a pattern to them. So when the birds land on there, it adds an extra element of interest and some character to the image. So with this type of shot, you do often need a bigger lens. I was just shooting with my 400mm, but there is something you can do that can help out in this situation. Rather than shooting from the ground upwards, Let's elevate our own position and that's gonna give us a different perspective on things. So I've come up into my office, which is up in the loft and I've got these nice two big skylights to shoot through. And I encourage you to shoot out of some of your windows at a higher position if possible as well. Now a big advantage to shooting from a window that's slightly higher up is when you're shooting down from the ground, telephotos tend to work best because you're a bit further away from your subjects. Once you get up to a higher position, you can still use your telephotos but also lenses like the 70 to 200, which can give you a different perspective and a slightly wider view. And from that higher up position, you can include a bit more of the rooftop as well in your photo. Now, if you decide to take a shot like this and you go for a small in the frame subject, which can work really nicely, just remember that on the back of the camera, that small subject is gonna look pretty tiny and you might think the image doesn't work. But when you get it onto the big screen, it actually works very nicely. As an example, we've got this starling here. 
And when I took this photo, I loved the light on the rooftops. I thought it was really nice. I wanted to include a bit of the roof. I really liked the shapes. I liked the shadows. I liked the light. The styling was tiny. On the back of the camera, it looked so small. But that doesn't matter because I knew that once I saw it on the big screen, it would come alive and all the detail would be there. Now that image for me was an example of two things. One, how small in the frame can work really well. But two, how an image that doesn't sound like it should look very nice can actually be quite photogenic. A styling on a rooftop doesn't sound particularly appealing, but when you put it into context of the image and you've got some nice light and some nice shadows and some warm tones, it comes alive. And that's really what it's all about, thinking outside the box and waiting for the light to suit the situation you're shooting in. So apart from small in the frame, what other types of photos can we take of birds on the rooftop? Well, of course, we've got the silhouettes, the classic kind of shot, and that can work really well in two ways. One, it works really nicely when you've got a nice sunset, so you've got those nice warm tones. And two, what I like to do when I don't have a nice sunset, if I still have quite a bright sky, maybe a bit hazy or a bit washed out, rather than have a silhouette that's essentially black and gray, I adjust my white balance in camera and I turn it down into the cooler Kelvin tones and that gives me an image that's black and blue. But it just turns a simple silhouette that can look quite dull into something a bit more interesting. And it's not just about the chimneys and the aerials, anything can work well. I have a telephone pole at the end of my street and when the pigeons land on that, what's really nice is in the evening, the sun slowly creeps up the pole so it goes into shade from the bottom, light at the top. And right at the end of the day, there's just a tiny bit of light at the top. And the other day I had a pigeon up there and it worked really well because there's just a little spot of light on his head and then you've got the rest of the frame is this nice chunky pole with these lines coming out of it and, and so it becomes a bit of a graphic image really and it just balanced quite nicely and I think it works really well. And don't forget you never know what might fly over your garden. While I was recording some of these tips a red kite flew over and now this is the first time it's happened in the seven years I've lived in this house and it caught me so off guard that I ran Ooh, to grab a kite, camera kite, forgetting kite, that it was kite. in my hand. Oh. I only managed to take two frames, but it looked straight at me for one of them. And so I got this really nice photo of a red kite from my garden, which is something I never would have expected to take. I hope that's helped inspire you into thinking about ways in which you can photograph wildlife, not just in your garden, but also slightly further afield, but within the vicinity. So grab your camera, look to the skies and see what you can come up with. So for this tip, we're going to be looking at how to incorporate flash into our photos. But before we do, we're going to cover some basic advice. First of all, it's really important that we use one of these, a softbox. That's going to help diffuse the light. If you don't have a softbox, you can refer back to one of our previous Create Your Light challenges about gear hacking to see how you can make your own. Secondly, it's really important that if you've never used flash before, before you start using it with your wildlife, just take some pictures of some plant pots or something around the garden to understand how to control flash exposure. And thirdly, the way that really works is you set the camera for the ambient light conditions and the way you want to record those. And then you use your flash to fill in the shadows and the difference from that. But what you should look to do is use your aperture and your ISO to make the camera a bit more sensitive to light. And then that way you don't have to have the flash on full power. So quite often I find myself at a 32 or 64th of full power. So having the settings really quite low often works really well. So there are a few different ways of incorporating flash into your photos. And one of my favorite ways is to use a slow shutter speed and rear curtain sync in order to capture movement, but also freeze it at the same time. It's a really effective way of photographing wildlife that's moving, especially birds in flight, because the wings can make quite nice patterns in the air. So the setup for this shot, I placed a flexible arm onto a barrel. I attached my flash to that arm. I used my diffuser. I then placed that underneath the bird table. I moved back to the house using my 400 millimeter lens. And then I just had to wait for the pigeon to fly from the shed across to the bird table. And as it did, I was shooting into a dark background, so I had to wait for the light to be just in the right position. So I needed the pigeon in the light, but I needed the background to be in the shade. So that would give me some contrast to play with. And that would really enable me to slow my shutter speed down to capture the movement of the pigeon, but give me a dark background at the same time. And then with rear curtain sync, the flash fires at the end of the exposure. And so I end up with a photo of the pigeon streaking across the frame, but frozen at the end of it. If I'd used front curtain sync, so the flash fired first, you'd get the frozen portion of the bird at the left-hand side of the frame and then the blur going right. So it would almost look like it's flying backwards and it wouldn't quite have the same effect. Now the trick to this is although we want the pigeon in the light and a dark background, the light in the foreground can't be too bright. So it has to be bright enough that it captures some movement of the bird, but also it has to be 
low enough that I can get a slow shutter speed, but also keeping that dark background. So it really does need the right lighting conditions. But as you can see, when it works, it works really, really well. Now, when taking these types of slow shutter speed shots, you're also gonna end up with quite a big depth of field. So F20, F22 isn't unusual. And that's because you wanna slow the light down as much as possible. And that's gonna enable you to not only get those nice streaky movements, but it's also gonna help because your depth of field is that much bigger if the bird doesn't fly in exactly from the right kind of angle or distance, that extra depth of field is just going to help you make sure you get as much of it in focus as possible. So with almost exactly the same setup, except instead of using a 400mm lens, I use a wider angle on my tripod just in front of the bird table, I was able to capture a completely different looking photo, and this time with the pigeon flying straight towards the camera. Now I used a higher shutter speed because I wanted to freeze most of the action, and then the flash here just fills in the shadows. So you get two very similar setups, but two completely different looking photos. And of course, with the camera at the bird table, I can't be standing there. So I'm using a remote shutter to trigger the camera. So I would consider using flash to fill in the shadows as a beginner's way of using it. I would consider slow shutter speeds and rear curtain sync as kind of intermediate. And then an advanced way of using flash is to photograph wildlife at night. Now when photographing wildlife using flash at night, it's absolutely vital that you use a soft box or a diffuser, and also that you keep the flash away from eye level and you keep it up high on the peripheries or to the sides. So never have it firing directly at your subject. It's also more important than ever to make sure you use your aperture and your ISO to increase the camera's sensitivity. So photos using flash at night are quite often in the ISO 1000 plus range because that enables you to keep the output of the flash low but still enabling you to have the camera be sensitive enough to record that light. So there's a couple of ways of approaching this. You can use a long exposure and front curtain sync. The long exposure is gonna capture all the ambient lights. So you can get the stars in the sky, that kind of thing. The, the flash freezes the subject at the beginning of the exposure. So it doesn't matter that it wanders off. You're gonna get a nice sharp subject and you're also gonna get lots of ambient lights. So the stars in the sky, that kind of thing can be a really nice effect. Secondly, you can use a fast shutter speed. So maybe 250th of a second cut out all of the ambient light so it's just black. Just use the flash as creatively as you wish to light the subject in any way you desire. There really are so many different ways you can incorporate flash into your photos. You can fill in the shadows, you can record movement, but also freeze it at the same time. You can make daytime look like nighttime, and at nighttime you can include the stars in the sky and have long exposures but still freeze your subject. There really are so many creative possibilities. So remember, be responsible, have your flashes on the peripheral vision if possible, not firing straight at your subject. It doesn't matter if you've got a brand new flash that's remote and wireless all built in or whether you're using an old one, just make sure it's not on the camera. That's it, get creative and see how you can incorporate some interesting lighting into your photos. Let's look at some tips on lighting. So I've got a garden that's enclosed by quite a few trees and so I get quite a lot of shadow and shade in my garden and so I tend to take quite moody and dramatic looking photos because of that. The important thing to do is watch how the sun tracks through the sky during the day and make a note of how the shadow changes, how the light changes. The light direction is going to vary throughout the day. Something that looks good in the morning might not be lit so well in the evening and vice versa. If you find yourself shooting in high contrast light, such as the light I'm standing in now, the important thing to do is to expose for the light, wait for the subject to be in the light, and then take your photo. So as an example, you may find yourself underexposing by as much as two or three stops if the light's really contrasty. The idea if you do that is to have a nice dark background behind. So you'll see here, I'm standing in the light, it's hitting me from the side, it's very bright, but the background is quite shaded, so I'm standing out against the background, and also the side of my shed is currently shaded as well. So there's dark areas on either side of the frame, which allows me to stand out a bit more by standing in the light in the middle of the frame. The key thing to remember here is it's not the subject that makes the photo interesting, it's the light and the way you capture it. And that is what's gonna add drama and impact to your images. So one type of photo that works really well in the evening in my garden is rimlit silhouettes. And you can see I've actually got a bit of rim light on me now. And that's because I'm standing between the camera and the sun. And so I need to get my subject between the camera and the sun. And so what happens is pigeons run across the shed roof here, where the shed roof intersects with the roof of the house. You can see the house roof is in shade, but because I'm shooting into the sun, I get a nice dark background and then I get a nice bright light shining through the bird's feathers. And so I get this nice line running through the frame that just leads us to the beak, which has got a nice warm glow to it. 
and so it's just a nice way of showing a familiar subject in a slightly different way. One of my favourite types of light to work with in the garden is dappled light and that works perfectly for me in this environment because there's trees all around the garden and dappled light is when the light filters through branches and foliage and it creates little spotlights on the ground. Now dappled light for me works throughout the day because it works very well in high contrast light, it's the perfect situation for that. But this photo in particular is one of my favourite examples and this was taken late afternoon as the sun is setting, the light filters through the tree above the shed and creates these nice pockets of light. I simply expose for that light with around two stops of underexposure and then I wait for the pigeon to walk into that light and that gives the impression that it's emerging from the darkness because everything else around it is in shade and therefore it's very dark. The reason this photo works so well late afternoon is because the sun is just that bit lower in the sky and so the light's starting to warm up and the closer to the horizon the sun becomes, the warmer the light and the warmer the tones. If you find yourself with overcast light, so maybe it's a cloudy day or in the shade such as I am here, don't worry about it, that's not a problem. Good light isn't all about sunrise and sunset and warm tones. Overcast light is excellent for showing off fur and feather detail. A good example of that is this photo of a starling flying to my bird feeder. Now this was taken in the middle of the day and the light actually would have been quite contrasty, but because it was overcast, it was nice and soft and diffused and so all those nice details came out in the black feathers and those iridescent colors came out really, really nicely. Again, had it been contrasty, it would have been a very dark subject and it wouldn't have been a very good exposure. And a bonus tip, if you move your feeders around, you might be able to get different color backgrounds to your pictures just to add some variety. Or if you find that hard to do and you find it hard to get clean backgrounds, we're at home, it doesn't matter. I wouldn't do this out in the wilderness, but at home, we can put something in the background. Maybe find a towel or a sheet that you can hang over a wall or the fence, just to give yourself a nice diffused, even background. In the evening, once the sun has gone from the garden, there's another type of photo that I can still try and take. And as you've probably guessed by looking at the wall behind me, that's silhouettes against the sky. So what's the secret to a good silhouette? Well, for a start, because there's no detail in the subject, you have to make sure the outline is crisp and clear you can't have the subject in front of something else. If you could see detail in the picture, it wouldn't matter if, for example, a bird's wing was in front of a branch because you could differentiate between the two. When it's a silhouette, however, those two shapes would become one and it would have a distracting element to the photo. So what I try to do is photograph the pigeons walking across a wall here. And a quick tip for this is if you've got a fence or a wall or something you want birds to land on, put a feeder near that wall and you're almost guaranteed they're gonna land on it before they go to the feeder. The other really important part to a silhouette is to try and have a focal point or something of interest in the photo. So you really want something that makes the image stand out and a focal point that draws your attention and makes you look and connect with the image. So if the pigeon's walking up and down the wall here, I try to time it so they've got their feet up in the air. And that works a little bit better than when they've got both feet down on the ground. If one of them's up in the air, you get more of a sense of the movement. Another trick is instead of having a clear sky, if there's some nice clouds in the background, that can also add an extra element of interest to your photo. As another example, if you take a look at this pigeon portrait, that's a silhouette, compare the two images. The one with the beak closed, there's no real focal point. It's just a bit boring. There's nothing really there to grab your attention. The one with the beak slightly open, there's an immediate focal point and your eyes drawn straight to it and it breaks up the image, it breaks up the silhouette and it just adds that tiny little detail that actually turns the image from something fairly mundane into something a bit more eye-catching. So I hope those tips on silhouettes were useful. If you find yourself with the opportunity in your garden to shoot towards the sky, give it a go. They're good fun. See what you can come up with. Okay, so that's it. I hope you found these tips and tricks helpful. I know some of these might seem a little bit weird and a little bit quirky, but that's the whole idea. It's to get you thinking a bit differently to see where it leads you. Just remember, it's so important to celebrate the wildlife in and around your garden. You really don't have to travel to the ends of the earth and out into the wilderness to spend time in nature. And it's important to remember that even just listening to wildlife is quite therapeutic. So just sit out in the garden for a few hours. Just watch, listen, and see what comes into the garden because I'm willing to bet there'll be a lot more wildlife around than you probably realise. The key things are take advantage of the light, change your focal lengths, look around you, look up, see what's around, use any props you've got lying around. Remember out in the wild man-made objects don't necessarily fit in but in the garden it's the perfect opportunity and actually they play an important part of the image. With all that said it's over to you. Good luck, remember to tag your images with create your light and enjoy spending time in your own private nature reserve while doing wildlife photography at home.